You matter so much. Uh, uh. Guys, the reason why I'm so passionate about this, the reason why I started this program, the reason why I'm gonna spend the rest of my life helping as many students as I possibly can. When I was a little boy in Buffalo, New York, I was one of those kids. I was going so badly. My mother couldn't afford clothes for us to go to school. That's how poor we were. She bought our clothes at garage sales. She spent pennies, nickels, and dimes on pants, shoes, shirts, and sneakers, and nothing fit properly. We looked tattered and worn. And when I went to school, the kids were just relentless on me. The whole school knew. I used to beg my mother to let me stay home. But guys, as I look back on my life, I realized I was actually bullied in front of a small school. And at the end of the day, when the bell rang, I went home. <laughs> the bullying stopped. And now, let me take you all on a journey. Let's fast forward to 2019, where all you guys have grown up with social media. You've grown up with the internet. And some of you have to read the most horrible things that other students write about you. You're ugly, you're stupid, you're worthless. You should die. Are you kidding me? You never know what another student is going through in their life. You don't walk in their shoes. Maybe their parents are going through a divorce. Maybe there's been a death in their family. Maybe they have a broken heart because they had to put down the family pet. Maybe they have a medical issue that you know nothing about. Your words can kill. And just because some of your parents can afford nice clothes or nice shoes or sneakers, it doesn't make you any better than me. And now in my life, I think I'll afford nice jeans and nice sneakers. Oh my gosh, I am no better than you. Do you realize it would actually break my heart if I ever hurt one of you guys? Man, I came to the great state of Maryland. I came here to, to Patterson Mill because I want to lift you up, man. I don't want you, I want you to realize how beautiful, how talented, how gifted, how special each of you are. How you're going to accomplish the most amazing things in this world. My gosh, I'm going to be reading your book. I, I'm going to be watching you play. I'm going to be listening to your music. But when you hear something enough times, you're ugly, you're stupid, you're worthless. Your perception becomes your reality. The guy as a little boy, that became my reality. I remember coming home to school in tears and thinking, man, why are kids so mean? But as I got older, I got stronger. As I got older, I realized that I have a voice. But guess what? I really have something even more important now. It don't matter how young or old you are. You have a voice right now. You all have a voice. Something I want to share with you that's so important, guys, and we have to talk about it. I get a lot of letters from students, letters that have really hurt me and broke my heart. There's letters from parents that have lost their kids to drug overdose or suicide. Those letters I never forget because I meet a lot of these parents. It recently, it recently struck home my own family. One of our close family friends, David and Jackie Siegel. They have a beautiful family. Their oldest daughter's name is Victoria. Victoria is the most amazing artistic kid you have ever met. She has a lot of friends, very popular, and she's so kind to everybody. But her kindness went so much further than that. She was a volunteer of the Humane Society, so she, she loved animals. She wanted to be a veterinarian. She, at the Humane Society, they only keep the animals for so long, and unfortunately, they run out of room. They have to put down the animals that nobody would adopt. And so whenever Victoria found out they were going to put down an animal, she would sneak them home. But unfortunately, they weren't the best-looking animals because nobody wanted them. They were kind of raggedy and ugly. And, and she, she there's, there's one right there. That's Zen right there. Zen is one of her favorites. Nobody would adopt Zen. He's not a good-looking boy, but... The most lovable dog you have ever met. And you just hold him up, he's just licking your whole face. He's just, just lovable. She fell in love with Zen, but not just Zen, all the dogs they would put down. And drove her parents crazy, but they had all these animals. When Victoria was younger, she started having body image issues, low self esteem, because she was being bullied at school. You know, she went through that awkward stage when you were a kid, and kids would pick on her, and she started falling into depression. And it started getting worse, and her parents started noticing her spending all her time by herself or crying. And so what does a parent do? You take your kid to the doctor. Wow. And the doctor prescribed her medication, and Jackie and, and David thought that it was going to be okay then. But the depression got worse, the bullying got worse. 
and then she started cutting herself. They brought her back to the doctors, and the doctor gave her more medication. Bullying got worse, the depression got worse, the anxiety got worse, and her life was spiraling out of control. And they brought her to a, a, a facility, a treatment facility, and she wanted to go. She wanted to get her life back in order. She wanted to be a veterinarian. She wanted to get all these things fixed. And in this treatment facility, she met this older boy. There's a lot of kids in there that were going through drug issues and things. And she met the older boy in there. And she fell in love. She thought this was the greatest thing that ever happened to her. They both, they both finished the, the course in the, in the treatment facility. And Jackie and David thought they had their daughter back. This young man turned Victoria on to heroin. Victoria Siegel died 18 years old from a drug overdose. Her dad will never get to walk her down the aisle. Her mom will never get to hold a grandbaby. They were scheduled to go on a cruise me. just three days after she died, the mom and daughter cruise. Her brothers and sisters will never get to experience another Christmas holiday or birthday all because of drugs. Guys, the opioid explosion that's happened in our country is second to none. There's, there's nothing worse than this. It's 200 kids a day are dying. Oh. Guys, that's like an airplane. That's like a 747 crashing every single day, 365 days a year. And let me tell you something. If there was a plane crashing every day, we'd have hearings on Capitol Hill. They would fix our airline industry. But our opioid explosion, they are not fixing. It's getting worse. And the only ones that can make a difference is us. Now guys, I know life isn't easy. We all go through stuff. But let me tell you something. Some of you guys, life is like, like, a, like a book, a story. And some of you guys have had some bad chapters, just like me. But that doesn't mean it's the end of the story. Every day you have to realize that you are an author. And every day you can write a new page. And those new pages become your new chapters. Overcoming adversity, never giving up. Making it in life giving to others, helping others, the chapters of your life. But guys, here's the good news. We can all make a difference, every one of us. And the way we make a difference is we come together. Harvard, we come together as a community. You know what? We come together as schools, huskies. We come together as a family. We can no longer back down. We can no longer sit down. We have got to stand up, step up, and speak up against bullying, abuse, depression, substance abuse, campus violence, suicide. If you guys are with me on that, I would love to hear you right now. You are beautiful. You are talented. You are gifted. You are world changer. You are super leader. You got. You got. You got. You got. Come on, Husky. Let me hear you. Oh, God damn. <laughs> you guys are awesome. I think they've called on to me. You guys are. I think they've called on to me. The teachers. Did you know that you I think so. Shit, I don't feel I. I moved out of my house. I moved out of my house when I was 18 years old. I remember leaving the guy, I don't need them. I'm going out here with Richard Davis. Next thing I know, I started getting these phone calls from my little sister, Andrea. I, you guys remember her? I'm so next to my heart, I call her. I mean, as soon as she called my phone, I just let her go to voicemail. She'd leave me the longest messages. Mark, I miss you so much. I wish you'd come by and see everybody. Dad said he misses you too. Hey, Mark, I'm getting ready to graduate from high school. Can't wait to see the graduation. It's gonna be so much fun. Everybody's gonna be there. I miss you. I love you. Blah blah blah. I never even went to my little sister's high school graduation. It broke her heart. Then I got a letter through the mail. I said, Mark, I miss you so much. I wish you'd come by and see everybody. I'm getting ready to leave for college, and I really wanted to see you before I left. I miss you. I love you. Blah blah blah. Never had time. My sister Andrea went on to graduate from Syracuse University. She got her degree in electrical engineering. I mean, that girl has always been so smart. She had scholarships for school and everything. So after college, she applies for her first job, a company called General Electric. She wanted this job so badly. 
She was sitting by her phone just hoping it come off. <laughs> I remember I had a swing by the house to get something and she heard the door open. And when she saw it was me, she was like, <laughs> and she come right at me. She gave me this big bear hug. And when she, when she looked up, tears are streaming down her cheeks. She goes, I missed you so much. She goes, I'm so glad you're here. And she does this to me. She goes, guess what? I got the job. <laughs> she was so excited to tell me. <laughs> she had to get a routine physical for her new health insurance at General Electric. It was at that physical they found my strandria. She had cancer. She went through radiation and chemotherapy and she lost all her hair. But she never lost her will to live. She never complained. Guys, I visit the hospital and she's worried about me. She's like, hey Mark, are you okay? My sister Andrea fought so bravely for eight months and I was sitting at her hospital that, that fateful day when she died. What I would do to sit next to my little sister today, my gosh, what I would do. I call it that. Choices. Guys, we are defined by our choices. The choices we make today, they can affect us and our families the rest of our lives. But sometimes in life, you get another chance. Sometimes. At this point in my life, I was now 30 years old. Years and years of drug addiction. I was working paycheck to paycheck in the construction industry. Guys, I was dealing drugs to support my habit. I had a bunch of friends over my apartment. One of my buddies, he had the remote control for the television, so he started flipping through the TV channels, and all of a sudden, he, lifts, he lands on professional wrestling. I go, oh, stop it there, let me see this. As I'm looking at the television, I get this overwhelming feeling. You know the aha moment? I go, guys, I can do that. <laughs> my buddy's busting out laughing at him. <laughs> You're crazy. Look at the size of those guys. They're going to pick you up over their head and throw you right out of that ring. I said, no, I'm serious, man. I can do that. My buddy goes, Mark, you're 30 years old. Will you start a pro career now? And guys, I just said those two words. I believe. That was the action I took next that changed my destiny. Just like it's the action you take when you walk out those doors. What will you do different tomorrow that you didn't do today towards your goals, your dreams, your passion, your family? Well, the action I had to take back then, I had to find out where there was a wrestling school. I didn't know how to wrestle. I was living in Venice, Florida at that time. There was a wrestling school in Tampa, it's about 60 miles apart. I started driving there after working on weekends. One year later, at 31 years old, I signed this huge, lucrative contract in professional wrestling. And not only that, guys, I wrote about it when I was 10 years old. I was voted wrestling's rookie of the year. Dreams come true, you gotta believe, and yours starts today by writing it into Make existence. <laughs> putting it somewhere where you have to see it. Taking action towards your dreams and goals, and do not be defined by other people's opinion. So guys, now for the first time in my life, I got money. I made lots of money. And when you get lots of money, what, what do you do? Yes, is there buying stuff? So the first thing I did was my signing bonus. I bought my mother a house in Sarasota, Florida. I paid cash for it. And then I started buying all the other things I wrote down in my little book. I went out and bought one of the boats. <laughs> now, oh my husky, gosh. That, was, that was back when short shorts were in. <laughs> okay, but then I got my first house in Marietta, story. Georgia. And guys, who's parked in the driveway? It's my black Cadillac. And now I'm rich. Now I'm famous. I'm hanging out with movie stars and celebrities. I'm having dinner with the President of the United States. Muhammad Ali is coming to watch me wrestle. I'm hanging out with Kid Rock. I'm touring with Gene Simmons and Kiss. Shaq's my buddy. I'm, I'm wrestling with Hulk Hogan. I got my own action figure. That's what I told you. But then I become a millionaire. And I want to live on the water. So I built another house on Amelia Island. I got everything. The world will say, Mark, you made it. You're rich. You're famous. I saw you on TV. But then after I cleaned up my life, I made it in professional wrestling. And it was just a short while later, I resorted to my old ways. See, the first thing I did wrong, again, the people I chose to hang out with. Alcohol and drugs comes back with a vengeance. Not just that. Now prescription medication and pills, the only difference in my life, I now have all the money to buy anything I want. 
and my world starts spinning out of control. Alcohol, drugs, pills, addiction, bad choices, hanging out with the wrong people. But I always thought as a little boy, if I was only Richard Davis, I'd be happy. Guys, I've never been so empty in my entire life. I thought, wait a minute, maybe if I built a new home with a fountain and tennis court and basketball court and lots of land, because now I'm a multi-millionaire celeb. So when I got myself a bigger house, I got everything the world was too hard. You made it, you're rich, you're famous. I saw you on TV. But guys, my world's spinning out of control faster and faster. Alcohol, drugs, pills, addiction, bad choices, hanging out with the wrong people. I got this beautiful home. I got everything the world will say, Mark, you made it. But because of my bad choices, I lost it all. That's right, I lost everything. My ex-wife of 10 years, she walked out the door and divorced me. And I don't blame her. Then I lost over 30 friends. Most of my friends died from their bad choices. One of them was murdered, a couple died from suicide, but most of my friends, they died from drug overdose. My friends, they were all rich and famous. In fact, I wrestled every guy that's on this list. Some of us, we toured together for 14 years. The reason why that's called a death list, it's a reminder every day that I'm alive of a list I should have been on. My name, Mark Romero, should have been on this list. Guys, I did everything they did, and some nights I did a whole lot more. I have overdosed on drugs on three occasions where I should have been dead. But I believe I was kept here for a reason. I believe there are students in this auditorium whose lives are going to be forever changed, especially in tonight's presentation. When you hear the conclusion of my story. Sometimes in life you think it can't get any worse. When you make bad choices, it can. I did. I was on a worldwide tour. We were wrestling overseas in Japan. After my wrestling match, I went upstairs in my hotel room and I fell asleep. There was this knock at my door at three o'clock in the morning, a bang. So I get out of my bed, I go up to the door, you know the hotel doors have those little safety windows. So I look through and I could see it was a Japanese promoter. So I open the door and he goes, Mark, you need to call home, there's an emergency. So I run back in my room, I get on the hotel room phone, I call back to the United States and said, hey, what's going on? He said, Mark, I don't know how to tell you this. I said, just tell me what happened. All of a sudden she started crying hysterically. I couldn't understand her. So I kept saying over and over, just tell me. And she kept saying, I don't know how to. I said, just say it. And finally she goes, what? Your mother died. I just dropped the phone. I ran out of the hotel room. I took the elevator to the lobby, and all I can remember is when the elevator doors opened, I remember running through the lobby, out the doors, and into the street. There was no cars, there was no people. It was three o'clock in the morning. I walked down the middle of the street in Hiroshima, Japan, and I remember just looking up and saying, Mom, I am so sorry. I flew home for her funeral, but I couldn't walk up to her casket. I couldn't do it. I couldn't. I stood as far back as I could. The line to say goodbye to my mom was so long. Like groups would come up and people come to pray over and cry and say goodbye. And all I could do was look from the distance. I kept thinking to myself, Mom, please wake up. Please get up. When the last person said goodbye to my mom right over, as they walked away, I got the nerve to walk up to her. As I got closer, I could see my mom for the first time. I mean, she looked so beautiful. She, she was dressed in white. She looked like an angel. And I just stood over and I said, Mom, you are my hero. Everything I am, everything I hope to be was because of you. You loved me so much. You gave me a life. You worked two jobs. You're the only one that ever believed in me. How do I repair? By getting drunk, by getting high, by getting stupid, by hanging out with kids that just wanted to party, they could care less. For oh, what? All she ever wanted to do was talk to me. I wish I could talk to you now, Mom. I wish you could see what I'm doing. Why couldn't I have been a better son? Choices. Guys, we are defined by our choices. You guys, remember my little brother, Guy Christopher? When I grow up, I want to be like my big brother, Mark. 
Hey, Mark, can you pitch me some? I couldn't, I don't got time for that. Do you want to play catch? I said, no. Can I hang out with you? Get out of here. My brother grew up okay. He grew up so much better than me. He married his longtime girlfriend, Gina. I'll never forget those two coming to my house with big smiles. And goes, hey, Mark, I want you to be one of the first to know Gina and I would have a baby. I said, what? I'm being uncle? He said, Uncle Mark? We were so excited. My brother got this really good job, and everybody's new employment. They had to be drug screened. In other words, they had to get a blood test thing for drug screening. My brother, Guy Chris, was always been deathly afraid of blood. You guys might know someone like this, for example. If my brother ever saw someone bleeding a lot, he'd go, oh, I'm gonna sit down and get dizzy. And sometimes a kid, he'd just pass out. But as an adult, he still had this anxiety and this phobia. And he was sitting in the waiting room in the doctor's office. And the nurse called his name. And he gets out of his chair. He starts following the nurse. And all of a sudden, he stops. He goes, nurse, I'm just getting really dizzy. She goes, OK, sit back down. And before she'd come back and grab him, my little brother, he just passed out and fell over backwards. And hit his head on the floor in the doctor's office. I was on the road wrestling, I was on tour. I get this phone call and they said, Mark, your brother Guy Christopher had a falling accident in the doctor's office. He's at the Sarasota Hospital. Now, my first reaction, remember, I'm on tour wrestling, I'm like, okay, how bad can you get hurt at the doctor's office? I said, what did he break his arm? And they didn't answer. It's like this long pause and she just goes, Mark, can you get here as soon as possible? What? So I asked for permission to get off the tour. Of course, they allowed me. I, I traveled to the Sarasota Hospital as fast as I could. I took the elevator up to the ICU, and I remember running down the hall to his room, and when I got there, I opened the door to walk in, and I could see these machines keeping my brother alive. I said, no. I asked everybody in the room to please leave. I, I just wanted to be alone with my little brother. In the room was my older sister, Jody, my other brother, Joel, and his wife, Gina. She was pregnant with her baby. Friends and family were around the bed holding their hands and praying. And I just wanted everybody out. I just wanted to be alone with them. You see, my mother died two weeks before this. How much can your heart take? I remember oh, left the room, so I went over to his bed. I put my hands on the and just stared at me. He looked so handsome. It looked like he was just sleeping. And then I got down on my knees. I grabbed his hand. I said, please, we need a miracle. He's only 21. He's going to be a daddy. And just then, the door opens. It's the doctor my family. And as they're walking in, I can see this look in the doctor's face. So look, you never forget. And he just says, I'm sorry. There's no brain activity. I said, no, th there's going to be a miracle. There's nothing more we can do. We had to make a decision as a family and let our brother go. Hardest thing I've ever done or ever will have to do, I mean, to sit there and watch your little brother die. But there was a miracle. We donated his heart, his lungs, all his organs. Doctors told us that may save the lives of four or five people that are on the transplant list that may not have lived long enough if it wasn't for my brother's gifts. There was a miracle. It just, just wasn't our miracle. One month after my little brother died, his precious baby, my little niece Falica, was born. She never got to see her daddy. But that, that little girl, she's grown up now, and she's a life in our family get-togethers. She is so talented. She plays the piano and sings, and everybody gathers around her. She's like our little superstar. The guy would be so proud. The guys, if I could just go back in time, if I could just grab the ball just one more time, Why couldn't I have been a better brother? Choices. Guys, we are defined by our choices. I lost my friends. I lost most of my family. But most of them died from bad choices. 
My friends, over 30 of them, suicide, murder, the most I've had, drug overdose. For what? My mom and dad died from their bad choices. My mom and dad died from cigarette smoking. My mother died from a massive stroke after years of smoking. She was only 58. And my dad, he was my best friend. He died while I was holding in my arms in the hospital from lung cancer. You should still be here. If you guys have a brother or a sister, when you go home, you tell them how cool they are. Tell them how beautiful they are. If you have a mother, a father, grandparents, or a guardian, when you go home, you tell them how much you love them. See guys, when I was a little boy, He's I believed a lie. The lie was, the if you're rich and famous, you're happy. He's so I grew up thinking, I gotta be rich, I gotta be famous, I gotta win the race. I had to win the race, the expense of my marriage, my family, my friends, for what? You all know me know? That's not how it's supposed to be. Life is not about winning the race. As I prepare to close, I want to share a short video that's going to inspire every person in this auditorium. It's about a man that was going to win the race. Now, to share this video, I got to take you back to the Olympics. And at that time, he was one of the fastest runners in the world. His name was Derek Redman. Derek was going to win the gold medal. Derek was going to win the race. But in the end, it's how Derek finished the race. He is forever remembered. Enjoy. It's not about winning the race. Life, it, it's about finishing the race and how many people we can all help finish this race. How we can start being kinder to each other. How we can help the students that are suffering from depression or anxiety or students have been bullied or abused and stand up for each other. How we can stop with the name calling and hurting other people. How we can start spending more time with our families and people that truly matter. Guys, I want to close. I just want to share a couple things I learned, and then I'm going to let you go. And I really hope I can see some of you guys and your families tonight. 
right here at 6.30. It's going to be an amazing evening. I've learned that no matter how bad your life might be. Guys, I don't know anyone here, but I, I know we all go through stuff. Maybe something happened at home. Maybe something happened at school. But nobody can help you until you open up and talk to someone about it. Guys, we can't take your broken pieces until you give away those broken pieces. And when you give away those broken pieces, they become like masterpieces because nobody, listen to me, nobody has the right to belittle you, hurt you, punch you, cyber bully you day after day, week after week, month after month. And the sad thing, some of you, it's been year after year, but it ends today. And the next thing I'm about to say, I don't want to see one person point another student. If you are a student at Patterson Mill Middle School that's been constantly belittling, bullying, making other students' life miserable, humiliating them, you know exactly who you are. I'm going to ask you to do something really brave. By the end of today, or the latest tomorrow, I want you to pull that student aside privately and simply say, I'm sorry, I'd really like to be your friend. Not only will you probably have a friend for life, but you know whose life is going to change the most? Yours. You cannot go through life hurting other people. You know, the world has a funny way of working itself out. Some people call it yin and yang. Some people call it where you put your soap. Some people call it what comes around, goes around, whatever it is. I'm going to tell you something. You will never have successful friendships. And the friends that are laughing along with you, those aren't even friends that we call followers. You will never have successful marriages, strong marriages. I need more adults going through divorce. What they say to me, Mark, he or she is nothing but a bully because they never change their behavior. I've learned that your happiness comes every day as you reach out and make another student feel special. Big smile, a high five, a warm hug, a kind word. And if they don't have a smile, give them yours. And finally, I've learned that people are going to forget what you said. They're going to forget what you did. But they will never, ever forget how you made them feel. Patterson Mill Middle School, Huskies, go out and make somebody feel special. I'm Mark Carroll. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you, Patterson Mill, for uh, just being an awesome audience. A uh, couple announcements, and then we're going to start to dismiss. So just pay attention, everybody. Stay seated. Um, first.